Good morning. Thank you for joining us. This is Amanda Fox with All Chicago, and also with me today is David Melnick. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to be talking about HMIS reporting, and I'm just going to advance the slide here so you can see the general areas of reporting that we're going to be touching on. Let us know. Use that question function if there's something in there that you think is missing um, or any questions throughout the presentation. Please do use that question function um, or comments. So we're going to go through quickly uh, first the dashboard counts reports. And as we go through each one of these four sections, we'll um, do a demo as well. And hopefully by the time we get to report writer, we'll have some extra time for those that are on the webinar wanting to learn about building reports. Um, we'll definitely go through some examples of how to do that with everyone um, and clarify some of the ways that we're generally works best. Um, but we also have some resources on our help desk around some of the reports that we've already built out that we're going to show you. And um, yeah, I think those are the big things to keep in mind. So moving forward with the uh, counts reports, uh, we want you to know that these are something that it, uh, can sit on your dashboard directly. And as I said, we'll show you an example here shortly. But these are reports that do just what they say. They provide a count of clients that meet a specific criteria. And the criteria is something that you cannot change yourself. So this is one of the most, most fixed reports that we have in terms of what it, it can and can't do for you. Um, this one, I'll show you the way that it quickly had to set it up, but the end result is the box with the four tiles on the left of the screen that you're seeing. There's a little pencil to the left of the word count, so if you already have one of these set up, you can still edit the four different reports that are sitting within it. If you do not have one of these counts reports set up at all, you can either set it up yourself, or you can reach out to us on the help desk and we can help you get it set up. But the beauty of these reports is that they allow you to see a count, a quick count, of the number of clients, perhaps, that have been um, referred to you, so incoming referrals, or the number of clients that have an open entry in your project without an exit, which to me is effectively your caseload on uh, an active case list. So on the right side of your screen, you're seeing what that count report produces. It actually produces a list of all of the clients that are represented by that number, and that list is downloadable. So this Counts reports don't give you all of the data that you might want to see about some of your clients. So we can show you in Report Writer how you could create something like what you see on the right side of your screen. Because um, what you don't get in a report uh, to print out in that downloadable file with the clients with an entry but no exit, you don't get the client's entry date, exit date, or the project that they're enrolled in. So there's a little bit of information that might be missing from what you can actually download. However, I think that this is an exceptional tool in terms of giving you a list of all of your clients that are actively enrolled in the project, um, just to keep you on top of entries and exits into the program. Uh, one other thing to add here is that this shows up right on your dashboard. This is the first thing. This is the first thing that you see when you log into uh, Service Point. So right off the bat, you know this is a number that. If, if you're in Service Point uh, pretty often, it's something that you'll see and you'll get to know pretty well. And if if something looks out of whack then um, it's something you can address pretty quickly. So you know, if you're seeing the same number or around the same number every single day, and then all of a sudden it, it increases by 20 or 30 percent, or decreases by 20 or 30 percent, then uh, it's probably something worth looking into. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that I love about counts reports, and I'm just going to advance the screen here, um, is that those, the client ID numbers you saw on the last screen were linked directly to the client record. This is just a screen that's helping you see um, some of the reports that we recommend that you try out. And um, I'll show you an example of how to link to client records. But what, what you have in uh, the counts reports is this dashlet window. Once you click on that pencil that you saw on the last screen, this dashlet window is what you use to set the reports that sit in that top left, top right, bottom left, to bottom right quadrant. And as you see at the very bottom, there's a link to an article on our help desk that will actually walk through step by step of setting up the counts report. Um, and we've been working on some of these articles to try to make them more and more uh, useful to you. So we can take a look at that article as well quickly to so know what it is in there. But um, this, this piece at the top about the specific reports that we encourage you to use, the one that everyone should absolutely be using is the very first one. Clients with an entry button, no exit. So you see all of those active clients. 
Um, the ones that you might want to use, um, possibly clients with recent exits or incoming referrals through HMIS. But if you see that full list in front of you of all the possible reports in the drop down list, note that there's uh, reports that start with the word client. And there's some like um, no goal set or recent case activity, things like that, where those are, aren't really uh, helpful to most programs. I would encourage you to not use the clients with no UDEs because that's not really a report that works the way you might think it does. So there's some in here we definitely don't want you to use, so that's why we're trying to focus on the ones that are absolutely close to you and that are in use around the continuum or around those you Now the big difference between the clients and the my clients is that if you are going to use a my client support, you absolutely have to find a case manager to that individual. And your volume, that's all, David. All you. <laughs> you don't get the person that could have been. Um, anyway, so the my clients reports are ones to be careful with because if you set up a accounts report on the my clients, then it literally will only pull in those clients that the user is listed as a case manager for in Service Point. However, I think they're quite handy, and I'm going to show that to you here. So as long as you know the difference between some of these things, it's um, it'll work out in your favor. So I'm in service point right now. I'm coming over to actually my dashboard because we want to look at this counts report right here. And I think we actually have a question or that came in. Oh, is the audio poor for anyone else? Felix had mentioned that the audio was poor. Is anyone else, please do type in if anyone else is having an issue with the audio and we can change a little bit of how we uh, are inter interacting with you by volume or by voice. Okay, I don't see anyone else telling me that their volume or the audio is poor. So Felix, you might want to dial in by a phone, um, but please let me know if you're having issues with the audio. So this is what the counts report looks like on my dashboard, um, but I'm going to go ahead and um, it's getting better. Okay, good, Felix. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take this off my dashboard to show you what it looks like when I start over without it there. So now it's gone. In order to put this uh, dashboard, uh, this counts report on my dashboard, I start with customize the home page, and then I just click to add the counts report here. So once I've added that counts report, um, I can click on that pencil right there to edit this. Once I do so, it pops open that dashlet window, and I can start to by selecting a report name, and I can set each one of the four separate quadrants. If I start with report name here, I see a few more reports than most users do. You all would be starting from here approximately. This is the one that I encourage everyone to start with if you haven't yet already. The ones that are a little bit more advanced, um, if you have are using Shelter Point, you might be interested in having this client currently checked into a shelter uh, setup or um, clients with recent exits might be useful. Incoming referrals is absolutely useful for some. And I'm going to show you how the My Clients ones work as well. But I'm going to start with the clients with an entry but no exit. There's the description. You cannot set the filters on these reports yourself. So I would start by changing this to all dates so that you're seeing all actively enrolled clients. Never run these reports on system-wide. Always change this to provider. You all should have a drop-down list here of the providers that you have access to. I just have to search, so you wouldn't have to search. I pull in the provider that I want this report to run on, and then I say OK. And now one report is set up um, to run on my dashboard. So that's all my active clients that are enrolled in that project. If I click on that number 25, it's producing a list for me right now all of those 25 clients. It is giving me their ID numbers, their names, and uh, some of their demographic information. But note that it is not giving you a good detail of information about this client. There's no entry or exit dates or anything like that. Um, so be aware of the limitations. However, one of the most handy things about this is if I click on these ID numbers, it's going to take me directly to that client's record. In addition to that feature, it stay, the report uh, list itself stays open here, the details, and I can click on this to open it back up again and then go to the next client record I might need to be reviewing right now. So that's the beauty of what a counts report can do for you. I can close that little window and go back to my home screen, and I can now go in and set up a second report to show you. 
Um, one thing I am going to do is come into this pencil, come to the top right, and I'm going to show you the difference of what the My Clients reports do. So if I do a, a My Clients with an entry but no exit in the top right, and again, I set that to all dates, and I change it to the provider that I want this to run on, and I have to search again, you will not. Uh, most of you at least will not. And then if I say OK, I am not sure if I'm set up as a case manager for anyone. Let's see. So I guess I am. I am set up as the case manager for three of those 25 clients. So my clients, if we look at those, um, of those 25, I am only assigned as the case manager for, here it comes, Theo, um, Mickey, and uh, Mr. Bowman. So if I click on one of these client records, the thing that's designating that client as mine is under case managers. And I am listed here by having added myself as their case manager. And there's no end date, so I'm still listed as this person's case manager. And that's the only reason they're pulling into that report. If I am no longer the case manager for this person this many uh, years later, and I put in an end date here, possibly going back a few days, maybe I stopped working with this client a few days ago, and I save this. Now, if I come back to my home screen, notice that it, the number is not changing. But if I were to click on refresh right now, that number should go down to two. Just so you see the relationship here between the my clients and that assignment as a case manager. One of the other beautiful things about that my clients option, um, and I didn't mean to refresh, I meant to edit. If I set up one more report in the bottom left, I can quickly see all of the clients that I am set up as a case manager for by setting it just as my clients. There's no filters. And if I go to the bottom left now to see what number that produces, it will be clients that could be enrolled um, in different programs. But in this case, it appears to be the same two clients, most likely here. Um, I would assume it's Theo, right? Wasn't it Theo and Goldman? Uh, so you'll most likely, oh, I guess, yeah, same clients. So, that's uh, some, uh, just a couple things about the counts reports. I don't see any questions that have come in, but I would want to save once I've uh, made those changes. And now I still have one open tile to set a report on. I'm going to quickly pull over for you the directions that we've been creating um, on how to run counts reports as well. So be aware that there's a new article on the help desk um, that explains what counts reports are and then walks through setting them up as we just did. So I'm going to go back to the webinar presentation here, and we're going to move into canned reports uh, to talk about uh, that reporting option now. So moving away from counts reports and into the next uh, type of report that we tool we have available, uh, canned reports. So this window in front of you is what you see when you click on reports in your menu on the left side of your screen in service point. And most of you are able to see all of um, these provider reports. ATAs are able to see a few additional reports to these, but these are the primary ones we all have access to. Um, these are considered all of our canned reports, and the word canned means that it, it really comes out of the box with the software, if you will. So everyone that uses Service Point in the country has these same versions of these exact reports. Um, and with that, any user of the system can run these. Same thing as counts reports, everyone has access to these. So these are reports that we cannot change uh, the way that they function or they're uh, at all. We can't see the way that they're set up or any of that, we, but we have our vendor to work with to help us understand all of that. There are some of these that are required and created by funders. So um, we'll talk about those in a second, like the APR and the PATH report and so on. Um, and we will look at a few of these, and specifically we want to make sure you know how to use the um, report parameters and setting up all of the things you need to put in before you can run the report to make sure you know how to do that correctly. But really, a lot of these reports are here in case you need them, but they're not required for you to run unless you're funded by a program that work, by a funder that requires you to submit these. So which ones are funder um, mandated and which ones are not? The first three on this list, the APR, which is the COC APR, um, the ESG CAPER and the PATH report are all of the federally mandated reports that are required to be there. But those are also reports that if you're funded by those um, funding streams, then certainly you are required to use these reports once a year. But we would also encourage you to run them throughout the year so you know what your data is looking like um, before you get into your reporting period. So 
that is um, across the board for all three of those reports, it would be something that you would want to be watching throughout the, uh, the year, whether it be quarterly or annually, that you have to submit your results from these reports. Um, the other piece of this is that you can use those reports, of course, or repurpose them. So if I'm a provider that's not funded through the HUD COC funding, um, but the APR has some calculations in it that are useful to me with those basic demographics being aggregated or some basic performance measures, I would use the APR if I needed to have some of that information calculated uh, to make sure that I was using the same calculations as the majority of other projects are. So use these if they're helpful to you. Now, the service transactions, referrals, and entry exit reports are things that are not required. They are just part of the software that we use. The service transactions and referrals reports could be useful to some and are. The entry exit report is um, a little bit less helpful to most. We would not recommend that you use that report, primarily because the only question in it that's really current in terms of the way that we look at the data is the second question that has a table. The rest of the report really is not up to date with the data standards that we're all using and in alignment with the way that your funders, um, at least federal funders, are asking for data to be reported on. So we do not encourage you to rely upon any of the results in the entry exit report, um, but the APR is a good uh, alternative to that. The ESG caper is very similar to the APR, so between the two, hopefully, if you are looking for something that you've otherwise found in the entry exit report, you could find it in the more up-to-date report options. Um, keep in mind that the APR, ESG, CAPER, since they are federally mandated reports, they are the ones that our funder um, spends the most time keeping up to date, and the ones that we pay the most attention to are, and are the most competent in helping you understand, because we are using them the most often as well. But the service transactions and referrals reports are pretty straightforward. Um, and I think we are also going to want to take you in here to a little demo of a few of those reports to see how they run. And then we're going to move on to talking about art after this. So um, if I come into reports on my menu, you'll notice that I can see a few additional reports that some of you cannot. But here are those provider reports. Um, so one of the reports that also that I didn't mention that was in there is the AHAR. The AHAR is a report that uh, All Chicago, the HMIS lead, uh, we are the ones responsible to run and submit that report on behalf of the whole system. So we're the only ones uh, at the HMIS team that would be running the AHAR report. But um, the COC APR is one that we can go into. And we do have another webinar that's been recorded around this particular report to help people learn more about that one if you're here for that. Um, the ESG CAPER is one of the other reports we mentioned, the PATH report, and the referrals and service transactions. I'm being very intentional in reporting in pointing out those particular reports because they're the ones that we would encourage you to explore uh, before some of the others. So if I go into the COC APR, what we want to make sure you know how to do is uh, set up these parameters. So notice that you have starting at the top for these options, you have type. Is this on a provider or on a reporting group? There are only a very few agencies right now that are using reporting groups. Um, reporting groups are something that we can help you set up uh, or teach you how to set up yourself. And they are a way for you to combine two providers' data into one to run the APR as one project. Um, but the next thing that I have to make sure to do, because typically you wouldn't change this, I need to change my provider and make sure this is the project that I actually want to run the APR on. So I have to search. You all would have drop-down lists here that you would choose from. When I search, I'm just going to run it on um, I have to search on name. I'm going to run it on my permanent housing uh, program. And I'm going to use these little date parameters here to set the date that I want to use. And I'm ignoring the, the provider and its subordinates and this provider only. I'm not going to set those right now because I don't need to. Um, instead, I'm going to just use this little um, date feature here if I want to use the calendar. Uh, to go back to um, last year, perhaps, or maybe just the beginning of this year, if I want to run the report from the beginning of the year to now to see how all my data fares, um, I can run it that way for the date range and then put in my type. This is the type that I use when I create um, entries. Is it a HUD type or something else? And then I just build the report. And you'll notice there's a use previous, previous parameters button up here. 
Um, most users, if not all, have access to this Use Previous Parameters button. It's a way to quickly reset all of these options to exactly what I just um, put in, so the last used parameters. So this report then produces results, and I can scroll through it to review the information before, if I'm submitting it, before I would download it for my submission into Sage. But that's only if you're using this report for the purposes of um, actually satisfying your contractual, <coughs> contractual obligation to uh, submit an APR. Beyond that, if you are someone that just needs to know what's going on in your data and you want to see the total number of persons that you've served in the, between those dates, um, you can actually click on this number that represents the total list of those clients. Um, you can also download that list. And if you want to see the uh, levers, and the stairs. This is a concept I think someone was asking, asking questions about when they registered for the webinar. Um, the levers versus stairs is uh, basically uh, going to total out to the total number of persons served. So if you add the levers and stairs together, you should get the total number served. And that means that the stairs are the people that are staying in your project. They did not exit, so they may have entered during the project time frame uh, the, between the start and end date, but they did not have an exit date recorded. But if someone exited uh, before the end date of the report that you ran, they would be considered a lever. So did they leave or did they stay? That's the difference between levers and stayers. Um, and then it is going into breaking down adults and other populations, veterans, you're chronically homeless, and so on. So this is, can be very informative. It's also helping programs monitor their missing data. Um, and it is going into other uh, ways of interpreting the results in case these are things that you otherwise have to report on. You can use this report for some of them. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole report, but it does go into 26 some odd questions. So there's quite a bit of information here for you to consider whether it's useful to you. Um, here's a question for everyone. Is there a canned report that you have any particular interest in knowing how to run or work with? Um, I'm not sure that how many people are watching this webinar today are interested in the referrals or service transaction reports. Um, I can run a quick service transaction report if you want to see how this one works, but I'm looking for some feedback before we move on to art in case anyone has something that they want to make sure that gets covered. If you do, type it into the question function. If not, I'm quickly going to show you how to set this report for our service transaction. So I'm setting it for the selected provider only, and then I need to set the provider. I'm again going to do um, a provider under all of Chicago. And then I need to choose one of the options here. I'm going to choose the needs entered by my provider because that's a good catch-all um, to capture all the data. But um, it also can pull in shelter stays. I'm not checking off that box, but that is something that's possible here. Um, I could select the specific code that I want it to run on if I uh, want to report on a particular service type. But if not, I'm just going to run this on uh, a one year's time frame. And I used that button to set it to today's date and then changed it to last year. And since I said I was going to um, pull in the needs entered, I set the date range for the needs. But I'm going to avoid setting the date range for the service. This is one of those reports that you have to kind of play with to figure out how it works best for you. Uh, but then I can see the clients that I have actually entered referral, or I'm sorry, services for, and what the service was. And then I can link directly to those clients' records um, as well if I want to go into that particular client's record. So that's very useful to know that you can do some of those things if you enter service transactions. Um, if not, there might be something else here that you choose uh, to use. But I think at that point, we are going to move on to um, the next part of the, um, the material here. And that includes our advanced reporting tool. So ART, otherwise known as the advanced reporting tool, is only accessible to those users that we've given a license to it. We typically give licenses to one person at the agency as a starting point. So ATAs, or agency technical administrators, will always be the ones to have access to ART. Beyond that, we are starting to grant other users access to run reports in ART as well. Um, ART is actually not actually a part of ServicePoint. It is something that's been added onto our software. And there's a process that occurs every night called a warehouse build, 
that pulls data out of service point and out of all of your client records and populates it into the advanced reporting tool so that we can re create complex reports on that information. But that means that the, um, the information in ARC is only as up to date as the last time that warehouse build occurred. So um, we'll show you where, how to see when the warehouse build last occurred if you happen to be a user with an ART license. But um, the most important thing around the um, working with data in ART is to be aware that you can only pull out what was in the system pretty much as of yesterday. So whatever I pulled in before I left work yesterday is going to be in ART today because a warehouse build would have happened sometime in the wee hours of the morning. Um, so now, what reports can you run? And there is a question. Oh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, from Sarah Circle, we've got a reminder out there from a longtime ETA that art does not update on Sundays. So, good call. That's very true. It does take a day off. Uh, so, reports. Reports that you might want to actually run from the advanced reporting tool. We have some listed here that we think are some of the primary reports that people are looking for. And the first one here, the annual assessments, is a report that's been around for a while, but it's become possibly increasingly important for those of you that have to do APRs. Um, this is what's helping you catch clients that are coming up to be due for annual assessments. There's no trigger in service point to tell you that the client is due for that annual assessment. This report is the solution we've created to help you uh, manage that. And it does give you the due dates for when clients are coming due and those that have already uh, had that need satisfied in a, an annual assessment has been reported. When you are running the annual assessment report, you need to be able to put in your start and end dates of your APR year for it to calculate that properly. The Chicago Data Quality Assessment Report is David's baby. So, you want to talk about that one, David? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, this is a report that uh, hopefully all the ATAs are pretty familiar with. And, uh, you know, it, it's run quarterly and can be run on any time frame. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and the goal of this is to uh, make sure that data is being entered and to the extent that we can verify it, that data is accurate. Um, there aren't a number of cases where we can do that, but uh, typically the, the things that most people get confused about on that are things like income mismatches or non-cash benefit mismatches, and these are things where we, we have two sets of questions in the assessment that are kind of looking at the same thing, and if they're answered contrary in uh, if the way that they're answered creates a contradiction, then um, that's something that we know that there's some there's some kind of error there. Um, but this is a report that. You know, it is essentially just making sure that people are putting in the data that they need to put in so that when the annual assessment comes around or any other um, reporting requirements come around, that data is available to you and is available to us. Because that, that data is super important, especially for the AHAR, which just completed. Um, if, if we have too much missing data, uh, the, the folks that we that we turn that the AHAR into say, hey, um, you guys are missing a lot of data, and that's a problem. And we're not sure that we can use this data um, to inform Congress of the state of homelessness in the United States of America. Awesome. Um, so, Chicago Data Quality Assessment Report, pretty important. Uh, and there, it, we actually just did a webinar on reviewing data quality as a whole and going through that report in detail. So, there's a complimentary webinar that you can always. Uh, Go back and rewatch if you didn't get to watch it the, when we did it live. Um, so a new report that was created mo very recently is the housing move-in date, and there was actually a webinar just yesterday covering that process of data data entry for the housing move-in date for our permanent housing programs and uh, the report itself. And there's actually an article on the help desk around that report as well. Um, and I can show you that very quickly here so that you see exactly what we're what we're doing on our side of things. So this report or this article in our help desk was created um, just recently to help agencies know how to run this particular report. So it run it is run by on the agency level provider. So um, it will pull in all of the clients that need a move-in date. This shows you all of the columns that are in that report 
and we'll show you all the clients that have also had a move-in date recorded already or completed. So that's the idea with the housing move-in date report is that it is actually showing you the clients that uh, have not yet had a move-in date recorded that have been enrolled in permanent housing uh, and those that have for your convenience. And then we also have the HUD COC evaluation report that we uh, are continuing to provide and support. And Dave's coming around to talk about that one. So uh, the evaluation report is something that we've been working to uh, make more accessible throughout the year so people can monitor their data. And uh, I think we're pretty close to a point where that's something that, that can be run on, on different time frames than the normal January 1st is January 1st that it's uh, that it's run on. Sorry, I, I, this is this is a report that we use um, during the uh, evaluation process to, uh, to to help determine uh, performance outcomes. Only for HUD COC funded projects. Yes, um, and uh, this is, this this evaluation instrument. Uh, since the evaluation instrument changes every year, this report has to change along with it. So this has not changed for the uh, to be up to date for the 2018 evaluation because the 2018 evaluation uh, I don't think has been fully all the way approved yet. Um, but once that happens, you know I get to work on updating uh, everything to, to make sure that that uh, that is going to run smoothly. Um, and uh, I'm currently working and should be done probably within the next few days. On editing the report to make sure that uh, it's for, for PSH projects is only pulling in clients who have a housing move-in date, um, which is something that I expect the evaluation uh, the evaluation tool committee is going to suggest because I, I think that's the way a lot of people think about their projects um, at this point anyway. So that was that was kind of an edit that I wanted to make uh, ahead of time because I know it's one that's going to be coming down coming down the pipe. So. Um, uh, in the next few days, uh, there, there should be an updated version of the evaluation instrument uh, such that uh, it's only going to look at metrics for people who have a housing move-in date. So people who you know actually ended up getting served by the program as opposed to just entered and then, or sorry, what you know somebody began working with them, but they never ended up moving into a unit. Do you encourage, David, um, the providers that are not HUD COC funded to consider this as an option to look at their outcomes measurements? I haven't considered it, uh, but I can't think right now off the top of my head of any reason why this report would not work for programs, um, for programs that aren't HUD funded. Uh, so they're more than welcome to take a look um, uh, and, and, and uh, check out their outcomes through that. Tool. Yeah, just see how you measure up to what the HUD COC projects are being measured against. Uh, okay, great. The last report here is one of the ones that's um, still kind of in a uh, preliminary phase as well. The IDHS and DFSS report is something that our team has worked on um, for several years, and some ATAs out there have been working with us on that over the course of some time. And it's, it's something that we encourage you to reach out to us if you are not already aware of the IDHS and DFSS report in uh, ART, and if that's something that you, you need, if you are scrambling outside of Service Point or even in Service Point to try to answer questions for IDHS reporting or DFSS reporting, um, and you're, you don't have a, a good solution already, then we can certainly show you what it means to use um, this report to satisfy those quarterly reports. Um, and that's something that we're also committing to updating for the most recent data standards changes, but that one's coming last, given that there's other reports that take precedent that are uh, also needing to change. So um, there's one comment here, um, and I think that's one that we're we're not necessarily going to be able to answer right now without looking into it more. It's about the housing move-in date report from Dana and around um, the report counting people that exited from the program. So um, we, we will have to look at the report to make sure that it's calculating everything properly. And that is a great point, Dana, that, um, that, that kind of raises for everyone to realize that 
just because we build a report and put it out there, um, we are not telling you that you shouldn't validate the results. Definitely spot check your results and make sure, especially with the new reports, because as I said, this housing move-in date report is brand new. Uh, we encourage you to let us know if there's ever a question about it so that we can investigate it to make sure the report is doing what we intended it to. Um, so that is definitely a good, uh, good feedback for us, because if that's truly what's going on in there, we'll need to change that. Um, and do I have an ETA, David, for, uh, for them at all? And when we'll be able to touch the IDHS report again? We've just submitted the AHAR, so just to keep in mind, um, our team has been hard at work over here submitting the AHAR, so that's what David's been primarily focused on up until the first, so what, Friday? Um, so now he's able to refocus on the evaluation report, and then I would think along with that, we would be able to spend some time on the IDHS report now. Um, I, I think that we might have to talk a little further uh, about the updates that are required. Um, I know that there were some kind of standing questions that we had had about that that we hadn't gotten around to, but um, the, I, I guess I, I just um, I'm not always aware of the requirements that IEHS and the, and the city have, so um, I might need some help in <clears throat> uh, in, in you know in figuring out what those updates uh, are going to require. So. Um, so can we get some help if we need it from uh, from those of you that use that report? If we reach out to you. Um, yes, it's the answer. Thank you very much. We will let you know when that time comes around, and that should be, uh, can I say it would be this month, we think? Yeah. All right, we're going to aim for this month, folks, and try to get that done before the end of the year. Okay, um, that actually is the last slide around art, so we're going to pull up art right now and just go into it for a few minutes and take a look. So to get to art, I actually have two options. I can use the um, art link here. If I have the license to art, I'll know it because of this link will appear for me. In addition, if I have the um, license to art, I'll know it because I'll have a link to it up here in the top right of my screen too. So if I click on either one of those links, I will come to the series of folders that contain all of our reports. Uh, we all want to start in our public folder to find our reports, as a lot of you should already know. From there, we also want to move into our secure folder for the Chicago COC. And from there, we also have, um, basically, we have the available folders that we would want to find our reports within. Um, you don't want to get caught off guard here by this APR folder. Be aware that that is one that um, the reports within it have been retired. So that's there for use uh, for those ATAs that have uh, are very comfortable with these 625 and 631 reports that um, were in effect in the past, but we have retired those because we have a new version of the APR, so those are not usable for, sorry, for submission to your uh, funder any longer. The CES folder is one that um, you can let us know if there's questions about, but we were really uh, focused on going into the data quality folder with you. Um, we did want to point out, of course, the annual assessments report. Um, the Chicago DQ report is right here. We didn't put it on the list, but we should have. There's also the consent ROI check report that is uh, hopefully useful for some. And the here's that data standards housing move, oops, housing move and date uh, report as well. And um, this perhaps won't pull any data for us right now because we would only be able to run it on a test provider. Um, if anyone has a particular report they'd like us to walk through running, please do type that in to let us know. I'm going to do the annual assessments report. So I clicked on that magnifying glass, and now I'm going to click on view report to initiate running this annual assessments report. It is opening up a, net, a separate window on my screen, uh, on my browser that is, and I still have service point open over here. So you do have to wait for a second while these prompts um, or the report itself will populate and provide you the prompts that you will set to run this report. But once the, pr the prompts are visible, you'll be uh, focused on getting rid of all the red arrows that say not set before you'll be able to run this query. So starting from the top, I would select my providers. By um, clicking there, I have a list of providers that have populated, and I can use this uh, little area to search for the provider that I want to run this on. I just searched on the name of my agency, All Chicago, and I'm going to pull in my PSH project. To do so, I'm highlighting the PSH project and using this arrow to pull it over to the selected providers. That then shows me that provider at the top of the screen as well. Um, at this point, I have two more um, 
prompts to set my APR year start date. And I'm going to type this in. And I'll do it from the beginning of this year. And I'm just going to do it through today's date. Typically, you would do this on a full year's time frame. And from there, I can now, now that I've set all of these prompts, I can run my query. And that one's a pretty simple prompt. Um, sometimes there are reports that you can run on multiple providers at one time. This one I only ran on one provider. So as I can see here, I have several tabs within this report. And I can try zooming in here for you. So what you can see is you have um, my APR year at the top. Um, and then select the, um, I don't know, there we go. It's just more informational for you at the top there. But what it's showing me is the clients that are overdue for an annual assessment by how many days, the one that has been completed, um, and then the ones that are entered and do not need an assessment. And the ones that were entered outside of my window of 60 days, 30 days before and after their anniversary date, um, the ones that were entered inside of that window, the ones that uh, anyone that might have had multiple annual assessments, um, and then so on, some other tabs here, updates and report parameters. So that's one that you can download. And to download these, I go to document and I save this to my computer. And I typically save these as Excel. And then it opens up down here as a file for me. So that's one of the reports that we think is useful for you all to make sure you know how to run. If there's no questions about art, I'm going to leave this screen unless there was anything else you wanted to mention, David. No? Maybe. Um, no, the only thing is that uh, the APR dates are actually pretty important because there's a tricky thing that happens if your uh, if your anniversary date is near the APR date, and uh, basically it, it can it can shrink the window. So if you have a client that enters your project 15 days before your APR anniversary date, the next year you actually only have 15 days after that anniversary. Date to put it in because it needs to be entered before the APR year is over. So, um, it, I mean, it, it, it happens often enough that uh, that it's important to note. Um, but I mean, you know, it only, it's only going to happen in you know, like one out of every 12 situations because, um, you know, you have a 30 days and, and for the most part, you're not having people enter um, so close to the uh, so close to the um, <clears throat> the APR date. Sorry, maybe it has more to do with that, but um, it's just something to note and be aware of. Is that um, you know you have the 60-day window, but if your APR date ends any time in that 60-day window, um, your window gets shortened a little bit. Okay, good to know. <coughs> uh, and let's see. I don't think there's anything else within here that we really wanted to make sure you saw within the reports themselves. But it does remind me that if I come back to my art window and if you <coughs> use all of my scheduled reports, what I'm trying to show you is that this warehouse build last occurred at 541 uh, in 30 seconds or at AM this morning. So um, the data available in art is only as up to date as this time of whatever information was in service point as of that, that time this morning. So you all would not have all these scheduled reports um, that you see on my screen, so you would be able to see that much more quickly than scrolling through all of this. So going back to our PowerPoint, we are going to move into talking about Report Writer. And there's quite a few of you that were here today to learn about how to build reports. Um, but actually, the majority of you were actually were here um, with an interest in learning about reports that already existed. So hopefully, you have learned a little bit, if that's what you were here for, about the reports that everyone has access to across the system and those that our ATAs have access to within ART. Um, but Report Writer is, again, a tool that everyone has access to. It is one that we're going to show you how to um, work with a template in Report Writer. So there is some. Um, ability to use a report that already exists with this tool if we create it for you as a template. But in general, Report Writer is more useful for a user to access their raw data in their projects for their own analysis. Um, it can be run on multiple projects to pull data out, but you have to know what you're looking for within the data because you actually um, are going into the, uh, the system to do a step-by-step -step report building uh, process. 
and within that, you have to choose the tables and the assessments and the sub-assessments that you actually want to pull data out of from service point. So um, you can see the step-by-step -step nature of the screen that we're going to walk through at the, the bottom here, that when you're going to create a new report, you start off with the tables. And that tables tab is where you also have the assessments and the sub-assessments that you want to select that will have um, data within it that you either want to set a filter on or that you want to pull in um, a field from in the results. The, now, when you create a report in Report Writer, you can't open it up and make a change to it and resave it. You actually have to resave a new version of the report, which is kind of nice because it forces you to have versions of your reports over time, but it's kind of frustrating because if you save the report, you can't make one small change to it without resaving it. So you have to plan it a little bit of what you're trying to accomplish. So with that, um, the tables, again, the, we'll show you this, but the ones that we find to be the most uh, useful for you and the ones that we encourage you to use in almost every report you would consider building are the entry exit table and the clients table, potentially the clients table. The entry exit one you have to pull in if you want to get entry dates, exit dates, or even destination is captured within the exit table. Um, and I can try to help explain how you think about what you find where but some of this just takes time and it takes trial and error um, so the one thing you have to commit to with report writer if you want to get to a point where you really feel confident in the results you get from it is you have to commit time to working with it because you're not going to be able to um, get yourself to a point where you are confident in working with report writer if you're only dabbling in it once in a while it's really something you have to find your way with and this structure of the tables, the fields, the filters, the counting preview and options, that's the starting point. Um, tables, we're trying to make it easy for you by telling you you only want to focus on the entry exit table and the client's table to start with. Um, if there's something else you're trying to pull in, we can help you work through that separately, but that would be the starting point. With fields, from that point, um, you're, you're going to be selecting from the tables or the assessments or the sub-assessments you chose which ones you actually want to have populated in the report you're going to download from the system. And then the filters allow you to put parameters on that data to limit the number of records that pull in to meet certain criteria that you can set. Um, the counting tab is not one that I find particularly useful, but it's really just an aggregate count of the values in the results. Um, and then the preview tab is one of the most important tabs because that's actually where you see what's pulling out. And one of the beautiful parts of this is you can move back and forth between the tabs before you choose to save the report all the way at the end in options. Um, so we'll walk through this so you have a better idea of what, of what it looks like, of course. To give you a quick sense of what you have in these slides first, though, this is what it's going to look like when we go to start um, creating a report and we have to go through that first tab of tables. There's at the bottom left your clients and your entry exits um, for tables. Notice that the majority of these tables might not really mean anything to you. Um, and that's really one of the ways to approach this is Report Writer is somewhat logical in the sense that the things that it's named should match what you're trying to pull out. There's a few parts of it where we can really help you get into the nitty gritty of how it works when it comes to services if you're trying to pull that data out because it's more complicated. Um, but in general, focus on clients and entry exits. Now, coming into the assessments part of this, when you're selecting assessments, this is you deciding um, and having some forethought on where is the data in service point that I'm trying to pull out of service point. And this is where you need to put your, uh, sort of your thinking hat on of what assessment are my users or am I as a user putting data into? Because that's the assessment you want to check off here to pull data out of. So this is literally tied to the exact assessment that the question is captured within. So if you're trying to pull data that's coming from the annual assessment or from your entry assessment, you would separately have to find those and check off the box, depending on which one you're trying to pull data out of. Um, so we'll show an example, of course, and you wouldn't be highlighting all of the ones that we have boxes around in one report. It would merely be the one that you want to highlight that um, you actually use and put data into. So, and then sub-assessments. This is um, all in one screen that we'll look at. 
but the sub-assessments um, should be somewhat logical in that they are exactly the sub-assessments that you put your data into within the larger entry assessment or update assessment or exit assessment or annual. So they are in alphabetical order, so you would be looking for the monthly income, sub-assessment, health insurance, non-cash benefits, or disabilities, depending on which one you're trying to find. Now, helping you distinguish here, it's, this can be an, an important distinction, that if you're trying to pull in the yes-no question that you find within your assessment uh, above one of the sub-assessments that says, does this client have non-cash benefits in this example? Um, the yes, no, client doesn't know, client refused, data not collected question at the top there you see, that's going to come out of the assessment. Um, so for that particular question, I would be checking off the box for the actual assessment that that question is captured within, whereas the information in that outlined red box is the sub-assessment. So that non-cash benefits, that whole area with the add buttons and the HUD verification, that's considered your sub-assessment data. So you need to see the distinction that if you want to pull in the report writer, the yes, no question, that's going to come from the assessment. But then if you want to compare it um, to which benefits that client is actually or the clients are actually receiving, like if you want to see which clients are receiving uh, food stamps, you would have to pull in both if you want to see just the yeses and the clients that have said yes to receiving the benefit of food stamps. So this is some of the things that um, pose challenges with report writer. We're happy to help work through this with people, but it takes a, a particular amount of um, either trial and error is one way to approach this, or um, forethought and thinking about what exactly you're trying to pull out of the system to inform any analysis you're trying to do. Uh, so some tips, and then we'll go into uh, an example. Always include your client's ID number uh, or client ID number as a column in any report you run. Um, there's uh, many, many, many reasons for that, but just starting off, we'll say, just always include that. It is a, an identifier that allows you to see how many clients uniquely you're talking about and um, help you organize the information. Um, so this, the, the next one, uh, don't include both AND and OR operators in the same filter group. Um, this one's, uh, this is one where if, if you're spot checking, you're going to be able to see uh, you're going to be able to see this error really quickly because you're going to include a lot more results than you thought you were going to include. Um, so when you create filter groups, uh, the way I think about this, um, since I'm I'm a, I'm a math person, uh, is that each filter group is sort of a set of parentheses, and all of those things exist together. And then when you create a new filter group, that's a different set of parentheses, and that filter group all gets assessed together. So if you're putting ands and ors in the same sets, um, it, it can, uh, when it sort of does its order of operations, that or um, could potentially be removing some of your other filters. Uh, so um, keep, keep the ands and ors separate um, so, so that you don't end up uh, you know, removing some of the filters that you want to be there. The filters take some time. And I think you have to start simple with the filters. Less can be more. And I think that's some of what David's alluding to, that your filters can conflict with one another, especially if you're trying to um, if you're trying to have report writer answer the question that you're asking for you, filters are not really the solution to that. And report writer is not necessarily the right tool to do that for you. In general, we think of report writer as a tool that gets you the data that you need to analyze and export it from the system and then take your analysis the rest of the way in Excel or any other tool you choose. So it's not to say that you can't use the results from Report Writer as they are. Like say you want a list of all the clients that are female um, and, and that's it. That's all that you want to know about your program. You could set two filters, one on the program you want to pull in and the gender um, of the clients you want to see. That's one way to approach it, is just do the simplest version of the report possible and then uh, filter more of the results out that you don't want to include using Excel, for example. Um, but as you get more comfortable with it, you can start to mix and match these operators and say um, that you want to look at fewer and fewer results to kind of get into the, the real specifics of what you want to see. But, um, but again, we'll go through some examples. So, Avoid deleting reports, and we say this because we want to be able to start creating some templates for you to um, re-save as your own, 
So avoid deleting our reports in particular, the ones created by All Chicago, in case you want to use them in the future. Um, but for yourself, you are going to see quickly here that you're going to have to resave your reports if you're going to make changes to them. So perhaps using the date of when you created them is going to be the best solution to know which ones are the most up-to-date versions. It's not a problem to have multiple versions of the same report. Um, the lists are in alphabetical order as you're going through Report Writer. So anywhere that you're seeing a list of the data elements or whatever it is, just keep in mind that they're meant to be in alphabetical order. Of course, we've told you a few times already, but we'll say it again, always spot check your reports to make sure that what you think it's uh, telling you is really what it's telling you. Um, and we since the last one we did on Report Writer, that if you do your first try, try again. And then when that doesn't work, reach out to us and we'll help you. Um, on that note, we are going to go into Report Writer and spend some time building reports. Um, we did get some feedback from you all when we had you register to um, know what types of reports you wanted to be able to build in Report Writer. And with that, I'm actually going to need to change my permissions just a little bit here. Because um, right now you can see all the available reports. I think we're going to do our consent person. We just have a test client that I'm going to, or sorry, a test user that I'm going to shadow so that I can show you exactly what this looks like um, when, if you were to look at it with, uh, with your own eyes in some ways. And I say that because it's not exactly what some of you will see. This is a list of all the available saved reports that All Chicago has created. When you all go into a report, report writer, you'll see some, possibly something a little different. Um, you could see reports that you created as well. So it might say um, your own provider here too, um, with some additional reports. We know some of you are actively using Report Writer and have reports set up and templates that your staff use. Um, and we are going to walk through an example of uh, first how to create a report. And then we want to show you how to um, resave like this particular report right here, the CES Active Referrals. We know that's useful for some people out there and that it's been set up by All Chicago for some users. Um, we want to set, show you how to set up this template as your own version of that exact report. But, but first I'm going to start with going through um, a new report to show you sort of the ways that you would start from scratch and then we'll go through how to take, a, uh, take over or create a version of one of these for yourself. So when I click on new report, I immediately see that structure of the tables, fields, filters, counting, preview options. None of these are going to have anything in them. So it's literally, um, you start from the left and move <laughs> to the right. So starting from tables, what do I do first? The very first thing I do is check off clients and entry exits, because um, that's how we told you to make the simplest work of this tables, uh, these number of selections here in tables. So start there. Now, um, I haven't told you what re report I'm building, but I'm going to start with a basic report uh, just to, basically like an entry exit report to show you all of your clients that are uh, in, in a given time frame that are active. So, and um, maybe what I'll do is just your active um, clients that don't have an exit. So if I want to approach this report where I'm going to be creating a report that should show me for one particular program, all of the clients that are enrolled that do not have an exit. So. Um, to do so, I've selected my clients so I can pull in their names, and I've selected my entry exits so I can pull in the details about their enrollment. So that would mean like their entry date, exit date, if they're, as I said, I'm going to look for ones that don't have an exit date, um, but program is also what I'm going to look for in there. So under assessments, this is a huge area. Every time our team adds an assessment to the system, it gets added to Report Writer. So this is fully up to date with all of the assessments we have in Service Point, which is overwhelming, if I may say so myself. But um, we want you to try to look for, in alphabetical order, the exact uh, assessment that your program uses when you enroll clients. Um, and I'm going to first pull in the entry assessment. Um, actually, I guess I will pull in the entry assessment, because what I'll do is also show you how to put a filter just to show you heads of households. So you just um, get a count of households. So I'm going to pull in the um, HUD COC and ESG entry for SOESSH because um, that's the entry assessment set up for the provider I'm going to run it on. And uh, I want to make sure to pull in the 2017 Chicago version. So I'm going in alphabetical order, order looking for HUD, 
COC and ESG entry, um, SO, ES, SH, 2017 Chicago. This is the one I'm looking for in that haystack. Um, check off that box and that's all I need. I don't need anything else from in there, despite there being so many options. Um, now, if I, there were something I wanted to find within the sub-assessments, I'm not going to check one off now, but just to show you an initial view, um, they are in alphabetical order. So if I were looking for monthly income, it would be right down here, just as an example. But I'm set with the ones that I've pulled in. I'm going to come all the way back to the top, and I'm going to go to fields. So because I chose the client entry exits and the HUD COC and ESG entry um, options within the tables, that's why they're all appearing here. And all three of these are giving me every single data uh, piece of data or data element um, that is available within that uh, list of available options. So the clients one is going to be a little bit more mysterious for everyone because we don't see this in service point. We don't know automatically what's included here. But whatever I check off in these boxes is what's going to show up in the results when I'm ready to download this file. So I'm going to check off client ID. I'm going to pull in the client's first name and last name. And as I look through this, um, just think about what else might be useful for you to see um, and check out what else you can pull in based on these options. So that's all I'm going to check off though is those three. And then if I come to entry exit, note that if I checked off the box at the top, all of them would check off or be pulled in. I don't want to pull in all of these personally. So instead, I'm going to come down to entry exit um, or entry date, excuse me. So that's their actual entry date. Um, and I'm going to pull in clients that don't have an exit date. And I'll pull in that column just so you see that there is no exit date. And then I want to pull in provider. What project are they actually enrolled in? So I can see that in the results. And you can just see what else you have access to there. So uh, notice that there's client ID here in the client column and I have uh, client ID in the entry exit um, options as well. I have no need to check this off twice. If I were to check this off twice, I would get two columns with client ID. So just be aware that that's not necessary. And if I didn't want first and last name, I would not have needed to pull in this uh, table at all. I could have just used this client ID uh, field right here and not pulled in anything from over there if I didn't want to. But if I want client names, I absolutely have to pull in the client's uh, table to get first and last name. However, this client ID field is uh, either or. I can choose one or the other. Um, now, the HUD COC and ESG SOES entry, um, I am going to pull in the relationship to head of household question in here. So to do that, I need to go in alphabetical order through this list to find where that um, piece of data would be listed. So I'm almost there, and there it is, relationship to head of household. So I'm done here. I'm going to go to filters. I want to set a filter um, always. I want to set a filter on the program. So program project provider, uh, whatever word makes sense to you, you absolutely have to set a filter on the project, um, that project provider, in order for um, everything else that happens to make sense because you don't want to pull in data that's not from your program. So to start off, um, let's make sure we all understand what these are. Um, client active and entry exits active. This is making sure you don't pull in deleted records or deleted clients. Don't take these away. Don't touch these at all. Uh, don't touch the operator over here. Just leave these as they, as they are and perhaps just start with a new filter group entirely and focus on this. Now, I'm going to add a filter. Um, now, I have to start from selecting the table or assessment that I want to pull in data from, um, or I'm sorry, I want to set a filter on. So if I want to set a filter on my provider to only pull in data from a particular provider, that field was uh, within the entry exit table. So I'm selecting that table, and that makes this question of the fields actually um, match what exactly is in that table. So to set this on provider, I will choose that option. Not provider creating or updating, those are not the things you want to pull in here. You want to set it on provider. Um, equals is the uh, option I want to use for this filter. Um, it's, I don't want to put it on any of the other options for this particular one. Equals is the one that makes sense for me. I am going to search 
And once I search, I can either search on the name or if I know the provider's number, I could have put that in as well. So once I search on this, I'm actually going to pull in my emergency shelter here, all Chicago, uh, and click on my green plus sign to select that one and then say save. So now I have a filter that says that this report is only going to pull in um, clients that have an entry into the emergency shelter. Now I'm going to put in another filter and I'm going to add it right here to the same filter group I was in. But this time I want to set it on to make sure that this only pulls in clients that have no exit date. So I'm going to look for clients that have a null exit date. Um, so to do that, I'm going to go to the entry exit table again. I'm going to look for the data element or the field of exit, exit date. And then instead of equals, I'm going to make it is null. So that means that these uh, clients that can pull into this report have nothing in the field for exit date. So now that's set. And I'm going to set one more filter. The last filter that I want to set is around which client records are pulled in to make sure that I only pull in the clients in the assessment that are listed as uh, self or the head of the household. So to add that filter, um, I need to know where this question lives, and it lives within the HUD, COC, and ESG entry assessment. Um, the field or question, notice that automatically changed to be alphabetical order here. I'm looking for a relationship, and I'm going down to the R's, relationship to head of household. This time I want it to equal self. Um, and notice that it mirrors the exact options in your drop-down list for that question in the assessment, and then save. So I haven't set any date parameters around the entry dates, but basically I'm just telling the program or the report to only pull in the clients that have an active enrollment. So this to me is going to mirror accounts report. Um, I can click on the next tab now if I'm ready to move forward. That's counting, and it's processing. And if I go to preview, it's also processing. So counting and preview will process based on the filters and the fields and the tables you've selected. Um, I can go backwards. If something in these results that I see pops up that doesn't match what I imagined it would, I could have gone backwards and changed it. So now I see um, that there are 20 clients that are actively enrolled. And it actually looks like uh, one of my clients appears many, many times. But notice that they're all different entry dates. So this isn't an error in the results. This is just showing me that this client, Theo, has had, had stayed in my program or had an entry in my program um, all of these different times. Now, some of you might have noticed that my results were 20, where when I did the counts report, I had 25 actively enrolled clients in this emergency shelter. But the one thing that the counts report couldn't do that this report is doing for me is it's filtering out anyone that is not the head of the household or listed as self in the entry assessment. So that's something you, that this can do for you that accounts report cannot, if that's um, something that makes sense. So those of you that serve families, if you're trying to get a count of just your households and the accounts report, it doesn't do that for you, um, the report writer would be another option for that. So if I am satisfied with these results, I can move to my options tab and I can go ahead and um, name this report. Um, and I will go back for a second just to show you, by the way, that it reprocesses every time you move around. So if I went to options and decided I forgot I needed to do something back in preview, um, then I will have to wait for it to reprocess. I haven't saved this report yet, so if I close this, this report is, is gone and I have to recreate it. But I can download these results, something else to be aware of. Um, so if I click on download full report, a little download button pops open and this report would pull up uh, at the bottom of my screen for me to open up as um, a zipped file. And then it would allow me to click in it again for an Excel file that's um, popping open on my other screen here. So just so you see how you can get that data out of the system. And then you could do with it anything you might need to for further analysis. So if I move to the, if I want to save this report, if I like the structure of the filters and the fields and the tables that I pulled in were, um, were good ones for the results I got, then I can go to options, name this report, um, and I said I would do it with the date. So if I put in today's date, um, 
I can go ahead and just immediately save this. I could add a description. I can change around the ordering of the columns if I want to change those around or put the client ID first. I could do that. Um, or I could change the way that these are listed. Um, and um, I could also change, oh, I would have to click rename. So if it's project instead of provider, I'm able to do that type of stuff if I want to before um, I save and exit. So if I save and exit this report, we'll now find that if I go in order of the letters and go to E, uh, now I find that example report. If I want to work with it again, I would open it up with this view button to be able to go right back into the results. Now, um, this is perhaps, um, and actually, I, I'm just going to close this one again. I'm not going to do any, well, what I can show you is that if I did want to make changes, so if I did realize that I wanted to include the children maybe in this report, if I don't want it to be just the heads of households and I want it to be all clients, I can come back to filters and I can just remove that filter and take that one away. Um, come back to counting and will reprocess my results. Um, I could have also changed anything else I chose to in the filters. If I wanted to run it on a different program, I could have changed the provider that it was set to. Um, I could have added another provider if I wanted to see two different projects together. Uh, you're welcome to put in any questions for examples you'd like us to show you of how to work within one of the reports. Um, and now it's showing me different results actually. So I was hoping it would be as beautiful as um, it's showing me the 25 that I expected to see in the counts report when we're um, on our dashboard, but this one's actually showing me quite a few more clients. So it's showing me 49 clients when I take away that filter um, on the head of household needing to be self. So I'm not going to try to explain right now exactly why that's the case, but I'm sure um, there's a, an explanation we could come to of why that's happening. So that's... Um, an example, but keep in mind, I cannot resave this report. I can't just save it without a name. Um, I have to rename the report, and if I happen to use the exact same name, um, I think that's the, what I named it before, I believe it will allow you to resave the report as the exact same name as well. So you need to be aware that that's possible. And I guess I did change it, to make it 2017 and just 17. Um, but if I didn't want two versions of this, I could delete one if I wanted to, or I could keep them and have different versions of the report accessible. So I don't see any questions that have come in for anything that anyone would like us to show them how to do. So I'm going to um, show you if I go back to the All button. Uh, there's an All button on the very far right with all of these letters in the alphabet. Um, you can look at the reports that we have created in the past if you'd like to um, use them or just learn from them. So, um, for example, the CES active referrals, let's go into that one. It tells us that this report will show all referrals to your project that do not have rematch needed as the status. So if I click on the magnifying glass to open this one up as it currently exists, um, right now there's no matches because I can't see the results for this report, which is exactly what I would want to see. Um, if, at least from your system administrator perspective, because if I come to the filters, um, this one's much more complicated. Notice that there's a filter group on all the need statuses, um, and then there's one that pulls in the update assessment and is filtering to make sure that it's uh, showing only the clients that do not have um, housing move-in dates. So these are clients that are pending housing. And then at the very bottom, it's saying um, that these are for clients that have been referred to Housing Opportunities for Women's Low Income Housing Trust Fund project. The fact that I cannot see data here means that I am not part of this agency and don't have access to their data. So that's a good thing. Um, I can still see the structure of the filters without um, seeing someone else's data. And if I want to use this report, I would just use this pencil right here to open this up. And then I would change this provider. So I would search. I would look for my own provider. And it's still not typing properly. There we go. Um, and I'm going to choose my, my PAP project or my PSH project this time. 
uh, phase. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to get results just to warn you because I don't think we have any data in here. Um, but the idea would be that I could go to counting and to preview and see my own project's results. And then I could resave this to say it's the CES active furls for all Chicago, if you will. However you want to name it, you can put a date on it um, to make sure that it's clear when you uh, took this report as your own. And then I can save this report. So now I have the original one that was there and then my version of it with my uh, agency's name listed separately. You'll also always have the dates here uh, next to the name of the report too. Um, so you have the ability to uh, monitor the versions this way as well. Now, if I come into one of the old reports that our team had created back uh, a couple years ago, you might want to look at some of the income reports. Mm -hmm. So things with income can get tricky very quickly. And we have about 12 minutes left of uh, the time that we asked you for today. So if anyone does have feedback on something around the um, anything with income or anything with the sub-assessments that you really wanted us to go through today, please do type in a question and let us know if that's somewhere you wanted us to focus. I'm going to start by opening up one of these reports to show you um, what's included. And this is a report that doesn't have client name in it. It just has client ID numbers, their entry dates. Uh, these clients appear to, um, wow, these are some old entry dates. I uh, can't really explain that, but uh, their income, their sources of income, and this is uh, information coming from the sub-assessment, whether they're receiving that income source. So one of the things that gets complicated here quickly is the number of records that you'll pull back in any report that's running around income, and especially anything that's pulling from the sub-assessment, because it's going to show you every single record that was active for the client. Um, unless you set a filter on the start date. So you can set filters on these start dates or end dates, um, but this is one of the areas where it can quickly become complicated if you're trying to get the report to show you exactly what you want to see, especially around income changes. Um, instead, what we might suggest, uh, and I'll let David weigh in here as well, is that if you're trying to look at changes in income over time, and I'll pull up the filters to see how this one's set up so you can see what um, exactly the parameters are on this one. But if you're trying to look at changes in things like income over time, you are most likely going to have to have multiple versions of the report to show you different points in time that you want to pull out data from. Yeah, there, there are going to be a number of different ways to, to do this. <coughs> Um, none of which, you know, I, I'm super excited about um, in Report Writer. But the way that I would think about doing this, and, and uh, this is with the understanding of the way I think about doing things is typically not the way that other people do it. But that my, my thought would be, I'm just going to grab every single line of income that is active ever and then do all my filtering somewhere else um, and and try to try to figure out uh, any changes in income somewhere else. Um, one thing that is important to note here is that this data can be uh, really tricky to work with for a few reasons. First off, if lines of income aren't closed out, like if, if, if there's no end date on like an old line of income, um, then that can cause some problems in trying to figure out the exact amount of, of income that a client has. So um, th there are things that are going to be tricky um, in looking at this data. But uh, the way I would think about doing this is trying to grab everything out of Report Writer, loading it into, uh, loading it into Excel or some other database management software, um, and, then, and then doing anything from there. Uh, but especially uh, because People thinking about increasing income, uh, it, it always depends on some sort of time frame. So um, there isn't a way for us to sort of blanket create that report. Um, it, it's going to have to be based upon more specifically what you guys are looking for, um, because yeah, because it, you know, in a change over time, like we're looking at something very specific. But uh, if you um, if you want to run your own type of thing. Uh, this this is uh, you know 
a decent way to do that. So as David was talking, I was thinking about some of the other things that um, I've learned as a user and how to work with some of this. And I want to take you through exact some of what this what the person, I think it was me, that created this report was thinking at the time and see if we can go back and see what might be other ways to think about this. Because you have options. You do have options. What you don't have is a lot of control necessarily in Report Writer around some of the things that David was describing around how much it pulls in. Um, so if you're trying to look at things that truly have changed, that might be the strategy that David described, where you do pull out the whole mess of data that has uh, you know, 20 plus lines per each client. That might be the data you really need to plug into another tool to actually uh, map out what changed. The other thing you can consider is if you, if you want to create separate reports um, or think about answering different questions, you can work with the yes, no questions and figure out how you want to set the filters on them to only pull in perhaps, like if you want to see just the clients that have income, uh, you might choose to pull in the question above the sub-assessment that says, does the client have income from any source? And it might be enough for you to go off just to having the yeses pull in to your data. Um, it might be enough for you to just pull in the data with that column listed of what yeses or and nos of what the clients have income, and you filter it out separately somewhere else. But I also would suggest thinking about putting filters on the information in the sub-assessment too, that if you want to see only the population of your clients that have income, and then you only want to see the population of clients that have earned income, set a filter on the yes that they are receiving that income source uh, as one way to limit your results. Uh, it looks like we do have a question that came in, so I'm going to pull that open. Yeah. And it looks like we're good on that one, so never mind. Keep the question coming if there are any. Um, but if you'll see with the way that this uh, particular report was approached, uh, we were focused on the entry exit, so we wanted to know who the client was. I don't even think we pulled in anything from this client tab uh, or table, so that's not doing anything right now if no boxes are checked off, which is okay if it's sitting there. Um, but this is going on client ID, entry date, uh, it's pulling an exit date, and uh, it's not pulling in provider notice, but there is a filter set on provider. So be aware that as long as this table is activated, it's been pulled in from this first tab, I can set a filter on provider without making it show up in the report. So just know that that's possible. And um, the other thing that this was pulling in was all the things around the monthly income. So let's see what it's doing with that data. How is it filtering the results that pull in? So ignoring the... Um, filters that are set on to active, those you just ignore and leave alone. This one is having the report pull in only the clients that have an entry date that is on or before 3-31-2015. So, and then it's separately um, pulling in clients that have an exit date that is on or after um, January 1st, 2015. So it's giving you your parameters of your beginning and your end point of your um, of your clients that you're pulling in, but this concept is all, it has been confusing for me, uh, and I think it's finally not as confusing, but I think it's hard for a new user of Report Writer to understand why you would put your entry date filter uh, the way that you do, and sometimes the exit date filter the way you do. So that's one part that I find complicated to think about the um, entry and exit dates and how I set filters around them. Um, but they're, they're pretty important of how you do those, and you want to be thoughtful about the operators you use and which ones would be the correct ones for what your, the time frame of clients that you're trying to accomplish. And keep in mind that the is after versus the on or after are going to be very different results because, um, well, it's potentially different results. You might be losing or missing out on some clients if you were to just to choose is after instead of is on or after, in case anyone actually enrolled in your project on the date that you have set here. So just be mindful of how you set some of these dates. Um, and beyond that, it is set up to look at just one program, and it is pulling in um, a lot of income information without any filters around it. So um, there is an or here as well. So there's a difference between um, what these two options are telling us, that it's saying that the clients um, can either have exited on or after this date, or they are not yet exited. 
So this client, their clients are either actively enrolled or they've left the program only as of this point and they entered uh, on or before this date. If I wanted to set another filter, I could around anything related to income. So if I wanted to see like just the clients that had earned income, I could just put in a new filter group here and add a filter and I would set it uh, on the monthly income uh, sub-assessment and source of income would be one that I could set, consider setting it on, that it could equal just earned income and say save. And if I wanted to, if I think maybe I also want to see the clients that uh, potentially have unemployment, I could add another filter and say again from monthly income and again the source of income and um, equals and then I would look for unemployment and say save. Now, if I have and here, the way this is going to work is the report's going to look for the clients that have earned income and a line item of unemployment income. But if I change it to or, um, it will give me the clients that have one or the other of those, um, or potentially both. The other thing that's going to happen here is it's not going to filter out the clients that have no's. Um, it's only going to show me the clients that have uh, yeses and no's to this, which we can look at here real quickly. It's going to still pull in the clients that have yeses and no's to this question, but it's going to limit the results and it's fewer results now to only pull in unemployment and earned income. So if I wanted to see only the clients that have yeses, I could set yet another filter on this, um, this question and have it say that it must equal yes. So I can show you that real quick. What do you want to say, David? Um, so sort of just to add on to what I said originally about uh, pulling, in, pulling in everything and doing your filtering afterwards, if, if you find that you're, you, know, you have your own reports or this particular report over and over again, um, it tends to be a lot easier to do that uh, if you contain a lot of the if you contain a lot of the filters in report writer as opposed to doing that work afterwards in Excel um, because in, unless you're running some sort of scripted macro um, it can be tough to remember exactly what you did in Excel um, in order to produce the results so it, it's going to be faster and more consistent if you put all the filters that you can um, into report writer that said, uh, if at any point something gets confusing and you're like, I'm not sure what this filter is exactly doing, sometimes that can be a lot easier to just do in Excel. But try to get as many filters as you can into Report Writer, just so those aren't things you have to do over and over again in Excel afterwards. Yeah, and that might be, um, it's interesting, one no is still populated in here. So you got ands and ors. Oh, so I got my ands and ors. Look what I did, I put ors and ands together. So I created a situation that allowed that to happen. Uh, did I do that intentionally, though, was the question. Hmm. Um, anywho, uh, what else was I going to say? There was something I was going to say in there. Uh, but I don't know what it was right now. So if I wanted to resave this, I would need to do so by renaming it and saving the report. Um, and I don't see any other questions in here. Oh, there was one other thing I was going to say. So what if I didn't get the results I wanted um, within the, the report I created? Um, I have a feeling a few of you might have experienced that before. And if that does occur, save the report, um, save the report, and then send us an email at hmiasadalchicago.org. Give us the name of the report. Tell us what you were trying to make it do and what's going wrong, and we will give you some support to try to fix it through the help desk. I'm going to flip back here just to make sure you all remember how to reach us on the help desk and how to reach David and I. Um, we can follow up and send you a link to the recording of this session when that's ready, as well as the slides that we pr provided today. Um, so we'll send that out to everyone. But um, please do save reports in Report Writer if you ever have issues with them. Um, send us the name at this HMIS at allchicago.org and we'll troubleshoot with you wherever we can or give you feedback if uh, what you're trying to do is not possible in Report Writer. Um, and thank you very much for your time today. We really hope that you've got the information you were looking for. And if not, just tell us on the help desk and we'll see what we can do. Uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day.